Live from Case at 12, the news at 530 starts right now. San Antonio police had their hands full after a wave of crime overnight. First up, two teens who were shot during a drive by. They were found by police in a home on Northwest 26th Street in North General McMullen. We're told both had gunshot wounds. Police say there was a party earlier in the day at that home when a fight broke out. Sometime later, a car pulled up outside and fired several shots before taking off. The 18 year old victim were told was severely wounded with the 17 year old in fair condition. Shell casings were found outside on the street. Police continuing to investigate that shooting. A man is in the hospital after he was attacked with a machete and robbed at the 7-Eleven store on Fair Avenue that's near South Hackberry and Highway 281. The man was found outside the store on the ground with a cut to his head. He told police the suspect demanded his belongings and when he refused, the man hit him in the head with the machete and took off with his things. He was taken to the hospital and is now recovering. As for that robber, police searched the area with helicopters and canine units, but were still unable to find him. A 30 year old man is in custody after allegedly cutting another man's ear during a fight. This happened downtown on College Street near Navarro and West Crockett. San Antonio police say the two men fighting when one of them pulled a knife out and sliced the other's ear. That man was arrested by police and charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The victim was treated at the scene by emergency services. Well, we continue dealing with brush fires as yet another one grew. This one spreading and damaging a nearby home. It happened on Overlook Canyon Street near Marbach and 1604. More than one fire agency had to help as the flames proved difficult to control. Fire crews say the dry conditions likely made the area around the home a perfect kindling for the fire. Luckily, no one was injured. Now to two motorcycle crashes overnight that have police still investigating what happened. The first victim was not found until hours after his accident on the highway. Officers responded to a call this afternoon on I-35 in Riddiman for a crash. Police say the 30 year old man on the motorcycle hit a pallet on the road Saturday night, lost control and slammed into a tree. But it wasn't until today that his body was found. Police did not explain why he wasn't found earlier and they're investigating the cause of that accident. The other motorcycle crash, this one happened on US 90 West near Lackland. SAPD says a man lost control of his bike hit a guardrail and was thrown off. He then struck a metal beam and was pronounced dead at the scene. That man's identity has not been, uh, man's identity has not yet been released. Well, a state of emergency is declared for much of Southern California as the Golden State braces for Tropical Storm Hillary. For the first time in nearly 84 years, the storm is expected to unleash fierce winds and heavy downpours. Arizona and Nevada are also bracing for widespread flooding. CNN's Jen Sullivan shows us how people in its path are coping. Tropical Storm Hillary already impacting Southern California's coast Sunday, dumping heavy rains across the state. The storm causing catastrophic damage in Baja, California, Mexico, now bringing damaging winds of up to 70 miles per hour and triggering flood warnings from San Diego up to Los Angeles. Some areas could see up to 10 inches of rain. Officials warning people to take cover. Stay safe, stay home, and stay informed. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office taking to the skies in low-lying areas, warning unhoused residents of the extreme danger. In San Diego Saturday, the U.S. Navy moving naval ships out to sea to avoid the storm's wrath as it hits the coast. Meanwhile, on land, residents collecting sandbags to protect their homes from possible flooding and high tides. I've lived here for 30 years and it has steadily gotten worse with uh, when we have uh, rain showers. But some residents scrambling last minute to grab sandbags were out of luck in Long Beach, California. Everybody's running out of sandbags. Crews in the LA area creating walls of sand to block the high tides from reaching buildings and homes along the water. But it's not just the Golden State that will be impacted. Southern Arizona and Nevada also expecting flooding. We're activating all of our crew to bring supplies, start thinking about shelter uh, positioning and ensuring that we have enough resources for the communities in the area. I'm Jen Sullivan reporting. Back here at home, ERCOT just announced San Antonio needs to be reducing energy use because of the extreme heat here. 
The voluntary conservation notice is in effect tonight from 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock because of continued high demand. Government agencies like the city and county offices are also asked to reduce energy. ERCOT says they are not experiencing emergency conditions, but they want to help lower the current strain on the power grid. To politics now, former President Donald Trump facing 40 separate charges related to his possession of classified documents he took when he left the White House. ABC's Selena Wang reports those charges in the ex-president's other three indictments are sure to be a big topic of discussion in Wednesday's first Republican presidential debate. Former President Trump has insisted he declassified all the documents he took from the White House before he left office. But sources tell ABC News former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows told special counsel Jack Smith's investigators he had no idea Trump had brought classified documents with him to Mar-a-Lago and said he could not recall Trump ever ordering the declassification of broad sets of classified materials before leaving the White House. I think this reporting shows exactly why the Trump team fought to keep Meadows from testifying. It undercuts one of Trump's main public arguments that he's been making, that he declassified all of these documents documents before he took them from the White House to Mar-a-Lago. Sources say Meadows also told investigators that when those documents were first requested by the National Archives, he offered to help Trump go through the boxes and offer the former president declined. I don't have any knowledge of any any broad based uh, directive from the president, but that, that doesn't mean it didn't occur. I just it's not something that I ever heard about. A Trump campaign spokesman responded to the ABC News report, accusing special counsel Jack Smith of selectively leaking incomplete information without providing evidence. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to all charges in the case and denies any wrongdoing. But all this comes as a Republican presidential candidates prepare to take the debate stage on Wednesday. So far, the former president says he is not planning on attending. Selena Wang, ABC News, Washington. Coming up on the news at 530, the San Antonio Zoo is continuing to grow as they plan on attracting animal enthusiasts from around the country. How they plan to do that when we come back. Get ready for major upgrades coming to the San Antonio Zoo. We're now getting a breakdown of the multi-million dollar project. The zoo's president and CEO, Tim Morrow, says their first focus will be on opening a brand new entrance for visitors this year, which will be in use by late November. Then by early 2025, a gorilla habitat will return to the zoo, which has been absent since 1991. There will also be a new event center, and so far, they have spent $80 million over the last few years, but plan on spending spending hundreds of millions more to make sure that the zoo is, quote, the best zoo on the planet. Overall master plan is probably around 200 to 250 million dollars, and that's going to be over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, gorillas is just the big start of what we're doing with this entrance and event center. And Morrow goes on to say the zoo pays for these expansions through donations and city funding. It's kind of hot to be at the zoo, but anything for, to see those animals. I right? was going to say, you know, everybody needing to stay hydrated, animals needing to stay hydrated, because yes, yet another afternoon and another triple digit high here in San Antonio. We do have a few clouds out there providing just a little bit of a shade at times. Now, as we head into our Monday, another triple digit day is expected, but we do have some brief changes that are expected to move into at least parts of South Central Texas as a tropical wave starts to move into deep South Texas on Tuesday. That means for some of us, we could find a little bit of rain, but the better moisture is still expected to remain south of San Antonio. So we'll get you a full look at all of those details in the week ahead after the break. All right, I said yesterday I'm all in on breaking the records. I see behind Mia, it looks like we've moved into first place on something here. We have, yes. So right. today we okay. have five. Yeah. He's doing a pretty good job. Yeah, we're <laughs> going to be pretty close to the highest number of triple digit days for a year, especially by the end of the upcoming week. But we did break a record today. We have a preliminary high of about 103 here in San Antonio. This now makes the 22nd consecutive day where we've had an afternoon high temperature of at least 100 degrees. So now we've moved into the top spot for the most number of consecutive triple digit days. And we're still going to tack on to that by one more day as we head into our Monday. So here's your KSAT 12 hour forecast still toasty out there tomorrow, but then it's possible our afternoon high 
dry doesn't reach the century mark on Tuesday as we see some of that tropical moisture move into at least parts of the area. So let's talk all about it starting off in the upper 70s. First thing tomorrow, 93 by 11 a.m. 98 already by 1 p.m. And then planning out the first day of the work week, picking up the kiddos from school tomorrow afternoon. Plenty hot 102 by 4 o'clock, a forecast high of 103 here in San Antonio. Partly cloudy skies expected and just a stray 10% chance for a quick shower before the day is done. Most of us will just stay hot and dry tomorrow and fire danger is also going to be elevated. But you can see by Tuesday, 30 to 40% potential at best for some isolated to widely scattered showers and storms to work their way through at least parts of South Central Texas. You can already see though that the heaviest rain is expected to stay south of San Antonio. But this change is all thanks to this tropical wave that's now moved into the eastern Gulf of Mexico. It's going to move westward here over the next 48 hours. The National Hurricane Center also monitoring it and still giving it a medium 60% chance for some tropical development. Maybe it can organize and strengthen just a little bit into a tropical depression or a low end tropical storm. Regardless of development, though, it is looking like the better rain making tropical moisture that it's going to bring with it is going to sit south of San Antonio. So let's go ahead and time that out here on your future cast. You can see by early Tuesday morning before the sun comes up, we're starting to see that rain move into deep south Texas, closer to Corpus Christi, stretching over to Laredo and the Rio Grande Valley. But it is possible that the northward extent of this rain activity could allow for some passing downpours to push through parts of our viewing area. Better chances the farther south that you go. Unfortunately, this is not going to be a widespread heavy rainfall event for all of our region, but it is at least something with some passing downpours possible generally throughout the day on Tuesday and then by the evening hours and especially through the overnight that low pressure system is going to depart off to the west, taking whatever is left of the rain chances with it. So you can see here on our future rainfall, the heaviest, more beneficial rain off to our south near Corpus as well as Laredo, and it will help out with their drought a little bit, but unfortunately with some of us not even tapping into the rain at all and the least chance for rain being across our far northern counties, that's where the worst drought still is. So we'll see what we can find out there, but just know it's not going to be for all of us. We do need to manage expectations. It will be breezy on Tuesday, though. Winds out of the east gusting upwards of about 30 to 35 miles per hour, and here's that temperature trend that we were talking about, potentially not reaching 100 degrees for the first time this month on Tuesday and into Wednesday. So we will take that victory. That is for sure, but don't get used to it because triple digits will return by later in the week and into next weekend. So that's just a lot of things that we'll be keeping tabs on over the next seven days, guys. Well, Tim's decided to flip the script and get excited about breaking records. Uh, we're, why might we put a work in? We're man. suffering. We've got, we got to win something for this. So we'll I, just hit 60 and then we'll be done. I love the excitement. Yeah, you got to be excited about something. <laughs> exactly. All right, because I'm tired of watching preseason football. Let's get on to the real thing. We've seen the Cowboys and Texans play two. Now one more to go. What have we learned? A lot, a lot what we've learned. The Cowboys and Texans, of course, wrapping up week two of the NFL preseason. So many storylines surrounding both sidelines. We'll get to those. Plus, the Longhorns embracing the hate as they near their final season in the Big 12. Football coverage brought to you by Davis Law Firm. Dallas's non-starters gave up several big plays to Seattle in last night's Week 2 preseason game, costing the Cowboys a win as they fell 22-14. to Unfortunately, the Cowboys saw a handful of its young players exit the game with injury, including UT alum and rookie linebacker DeMarvion Overshone who suffered a left knee injury in the first quarter. On a different note, the battle for the number two running back position behind Tony Pollard is piping hot. Rico Dowdle averaged about five yards on eight carries and a TD catch. Malik Davis, four yards on eight carries. And Deuce Vaughn's night was highlighted by an electric 14-yard touchdown run in the third quarter. These young running backs really, really, uh, you know, can pour it up in there. And we just, you know, frankly, Tonight, I would like to, I would like to, you know, maybe give them some more opportunities, but you know, we got, we got to make sure we get a really good, you know, um, evaluation 
uh, particularly this upcoming week against the Raiders because uh, this young group has a chance to be pretty damn good. Next Saturday, the Cowboys finish out preseason action against Las Vegas at 7 in the evening. The Houston Texans failed to find the back of the end zone in yesterday's 28-3 loss to the Dolphins inside NRG Stadium. One of the positives to come out of an overall lackluster defensive effort was rookie defensive end Will Anderson Jr. Anderson's gleaming performance included a tackle for loss, a sack, and forced fumble. Will, I thought he did a really good job of disrupting, right, playing on their side of the line of scrimmage. That's what we want from our defensive end. So it was good to see Will actually show show that. And that's what we know Will can do. But it was fun to see him, you know, make a play. It's fun to see the energy after he made a play. And Will has shown, just as CJ, both guys have shown to get better each and every week and proud of where they are. On Tuesday, the club travels to New Orleans for a couple of joint practices leading up to Sunday's preseason kickoff against the Saints. UTSA football fans are in for a treat this season. This is undoubtedly the biggest year for the program to date. The dual threat QB Frank Harris is back. The Roadrunners are in a new league. Their 12 game schedule features a late September clash with Tennessee, who is currently ranked 12th nationally. But regardless of all of that, head coach Jeff Trailer has full confidence in the community showing out for their team. You know, it's been that way, honestly, since we've been here. Obviously, when you went through COVID, that was a tough year, but still the reception from the community has just been fantastic. And it's done nothing but build and grow and grow and grow. And there's a lot of ante anticipation and expectation for this team. And those are all good things. We're excited. Texas's final go around in the Big 12 could be dubbed as the Longhorns embrace the hate tour. That's what head coach Steve Sarkeesian suggested of a season where Texas is expected to contend for a league championship before leaving for the Southeastern Conference in 2024. The Longhorns haven't won the Big 12 since 2009 and the lasting member schools of the Big 12 want to keep it that way. 10 starters return to the Texas offense. Plus, there's the addition of talented transfers on both sides of the ball. Quinn Ewers will start at quarterback. Jalen Ford will anchor the defense. Texas opens the season against Rice on September 2nd. Three games in eight days. That's what San Antonio FC was up against. And now on the other side of it, the team accumulated seven points by going 2-0-1 during that stretch. Last night, the club played Monterey Bay FC to a scoreless draw. Here's what SAFC goaltender Jordan Farr had to say following the match. I thought it was a solid defensive performance. I think we've been getting better defensively each game as the year goes on. And um, to us, we love scoring, um, but as a defensive unit, we, we really appreciate when everyone's doing the work defensively. And I thought today uh, was a big testament of how much, how far we've come. All right, join us tonight for the newest edition of Instant Replay. It's the first 12's top 12 rankings for the season. We'll also tell you what we have in store for the first week of the college, excuse me, the high school football season. And we'll have your final preview, the primetime matchup between Brandeis and O'Connor. It'll be myself and Larry on IR right after the night beat. High school football starts this week. Can you believe that? No. This week. Oh, Very my gosh. Perfect. So exciting. Get right, your thanks, pigskin Mary. classic tickets. That's right. Let's All right. go. We'll be right back. August 20th is recognized as World Mosquito Day. It's meant to raise awareness about mosquito-borne illnesses. It started back in 1897 when the malaria parasite was discovered. And we've hated them ever since. And just last week, the state of Maryland reported a case of locally contracted malaria. The CDC says nine cases of the disease have been reported this summer in Florida and Texas. That's the first time in 20 years. Be careful out there. Hate those things. It's been bad this year, too. They yeah, love not me, a though. fan. That is for sure. All right, if you're stepping out for any Sunday evening plans, very similar to what we've seen the past several evenings. Thermometers gradually falling through the low triple digits over the next hour or so and eventually into the mid 90s by 9 p.m. Still hot, mostly dry tomorrow. Few chances for rain, especially on Tuesday. For some of us, temperatures slightly cooler and then more triple digits by late week. All right, that's all for us. We'll see you back here for the night beat. See you at 10 o'clock. Have a good evening.